I'm going to talk about uh, sliding doors at moments. So what I mean by that is these kind of unexpected moments that happen in life that, that really take your life in a different direction. So you know, you're going in one trajectory in life and something happens. It might be a missed train. It might be uh, you know, a, a missed event or a certain event happens and sends your life kind of in a, in a spiraling in a, in a completely different direction than you, than you would expect. I'm going to share my kind of sliding doors moment, um, sort of the ad adaptations that I've had to make in my life, um, and really what I've learned on that journey. So that's kind of the things we're going to cover off. But we are going to start back in the 90s. That's where my story kind of starts. So it was a time of kind of you know, big promises, big expectations. If you remember these guys in the top left, left hand corner, big personalities, big football matches, uh, and also big bands and big hair with the Spice Girls there. Similar for me. I had big expectations. So this, uh, this picture was me, is, is me water skiing. I was traveling in America. Um, I was at university in the 90s. Uh, you know, had big expectations of what I was going to achieve in life and the things I was going to do. In terms of big football, football was a, a, a big passion in my life. So you know, I used to play um, on a regular basis, play for my university, play representative football. Yeah, captain my school football team. So all those big expectations around football. Um, and then lastly, you know, sort of embarrassingly, the big hair. Not quite scary spice, but pretty close to it. So apologies for that as well. So the 90s was also the time when we had the sliding doors um, film, which for those that can remember was like a slightly cheesy uh, rom-com um, starring Gwyneth Paltrow. And it's a really kind of, a story we've seen loads of times before that you've got a character where um, a certain moment happens in her life and you know, the narrative kind of splits one way or the other. So for Gwyneth Paltrow's character, get it running for that tube um, uh, on the London Underground, either getting on the, off the, on the tube or not getting on the tube um, would dictate what happened in the next part of her story. So you know, the one character, she got on the train, caught her boyfriend cheating, um, and the life went in one direction. And the other character, the sliding doors, kind of cut across her path, and um, yeah, her, her, her life kind of went in a completely different direction, which wasn't, wasn't so great. So the story itself doesn't really matter, but you know, that, that kind of narrative and that split narrative um, is quite a useful trait, that, or just quite a, quite a common trait in films uh, and stories. But, I think we're not really always aware that that happens in life as well. And it happens you know, every day. We pick up a newspaper, there's sliding doors moments that are happening all the time to, uh, to, to everyone out there. And you know, unfortunately, sometimes we've seen just recently that you know, that can be uh, with tragic kind of consequences for the people that are involved. So in the 90s also, a sliding doors moment um, happened for this chap. Um, so this was the original Superman for me. Um, his name was Christopher Reeve, for the guys that don't remember. Yeah, he was the guy in the 80s and 90s that um, could fly through the air, could uh, fly over, over buildings, shoot laser beams, yeah, leap buildings in, in one bound. Um, and actually, unfortunately for him, he had a sliding doors moment where he had a, an accident where he fell off his horse and unfortunately um, hurt his neck, had what's called a spinal cord injury, yeah, and left him yeah, unable to move and, and also unable to breathe. And, yeah, I think, like most people, I was kind of was shocked. You know, this was Superman. It was quite, I, in some ways, quite ironic. You know, someone that was um, the, the one that we looked up to as being this a superhuman being that, um, you know, that was left in this kind of situation. But I think, like most people, when they read or see something in the press like that, you, you know, you're shocked for five minutes. You think about it for a little while. It stays with you. But, yeah, you, know, you carry on with life. You know, my, my life wasn't around, was, it, was, it was nowhere near his. You know, I was at university. I was the one that was playing football that was, uh, you know, leading that kind of existence. So, you know, I gave him a thought, but I didn't really concentrate on him too long, like most people, I think. So, yeah, my sliding doors moment happened 1st of September in 1996. Yeah, and even though um, we're kind of constantly reminded that life can change in a split second, um, when, when days like this happen, it's, it's quite strange that, you know, those, those days where an accident's happen or, or big events in your life, um, they start very normally, you know, so I can... Still remember that day, waking up in the morning, trying to comb that big hair that I had, um, you know, brushing my teeth, all of the, the normal things that, that you do um, in life, I guess. I was on holiday from university. Uh, I've been invited, to a, been invited to a friend's house. So I drove down there, middle of summer, and I met up with a whole bunch of guys that I hadn't seen for a, for a long time. Um, yeah, really good times and, and good to, to catch up with everyone over the summer holidays. Um, we went out for that afternoon, that evening, and on the way back, we walked past there a series of lakes and, and rivers um, just near to his house. I think given that it was kind of middle of summer, summertime, we were young, 20 years old, 
a few guys jumped into the, uh, the, the water. Um, I kind of went after them, but instead of jumping, I dove in. And uh, I didn't realize how shallow the water was. I didn't know whether I'd hit something in the water. But um, I, as I tried to kind of turn myself over, I realized I couldn't. And I do remember kind of being a bit confused, because nothing really hurt. Nothing really uh, felt um, that I, I didn't feel that I'd done anything, uh, I, anything wrong. But I couldn't turn over. So I actually remember thinking to myself, well, yeah, that's kind of it, and sort of closing my eyes and thinking, well, I can't get any oxygen into my system. This might be the, the last kind of moment. I think my friend saw what happened, pulled me out onto the, the bank, and it was only then that I really realized that my body felt very different to what it had done before. It felt like someone had put a, a, uh, like a big wet duvet and wrapped it around me. I couldn't really feel my, my body, I couldn't really move my body, and yeah, I remember then thinking, well, yeah, something's really, really wrong here. The next little while was uh, a bit of a, a blur for me. Uh, I think I ended up in the local, local hospital. I remember a family and friends, they came to see me. Um, friends were there and really supportive. And I remember they, when they were walking out, you know, sort of sitting there thinking, well, you know, why is this happening to me? Why is that? Why am I in this situation? And they're able to, to move on. So, spinal cord injury, you know, what does it mean? This is a quick slide just for, for beginners. So, there's a short definition there of, of what it means. And this is a, a, a picture of Stoke Mandeville Hospital. So, that's the National Spinal Injury Centre that I was eventually taken to. So, in terms of what a spinal cord injury is, for kind of very layman's terms, it's, it's, it's hard to explain to people that you know, are able-bodied really how, how it kind of works. But the way I, the best analogy I've got for it is that it's like a, um, a very basic electrical system. So when the electrical system is, or circuit is, is intact, you can flick the switch and the light bulb will turn on and off because the messages can get all the way around the system. Um, when you've had a spinal cord injury, that circuitry is broken in, in one or two spots. Um, so you can still be flicking the switch, but the light bulb won't go on. So you know, I still know how to run, jump, you know, do somersaults, kick footballs, all of those different things that I used to do. But the messages don't get from my brain to, to the muscles that I've got. So um, it's yeah, it's it's hard concept to to get your head around them. But it's you know, from if you think about it from that perspective, it, it's probably the best way to to try and understand it. And so in terms of the rehabilitation that I went through, um, as I said, the Stoke Mandeville Hospital is a fantastic place. Um, it's full of you know, you know, strong positive goal setting, uh, really really great people, really supportive. Um, uh, professionals that are there. So the first sort of uh, initial phase for me was to get stable, you know, stability. And that came by way of traction. So for those that don't know, I guess it's the same as if you, you break your leg, you, you put it into a plaster cast for a period of time to keep it straight to let it recover. So for me, that meant three and a half months of um, staring at the ceiling. So keeping my neck very, very straight, um, hanging weights off the back of my head. And, you know, that was tough because it was... Yeah, you know you've done something wrong, you know that something's changed in your life, and you want to try and rectify that. You want to um, get up, you want to you you change things, you want to try and do, do something about that, but you can't. You actually just have to wait and let things settle down and do, uh, and do nothing. Yeah, it was tough. It was dark, you know, a very, very dark time because you didn't know what the future was going to be like either. You know, I had never sat in a wheelchair before, yet I was contemplating a future that, that I didn't know what it was going to be like. And, yeah, when you're stuck there, you're thinking, well, the things I wanted to do are not, you know, they're never going to happen now. Eventually, you know, out of bed, started working, working with physiotherapists to get the muscles moving that, um, that I could and to get some power back into those. I worked with occupational therapy to, to almost like relearn the things that I, you learn when you're a child. So, um, you know, my body was a new body to me. And so, you know, learning how to, to you know, handwriting, feeding, picking things up and learning to kind of study and work on computers, all of those things I had to kind of relearn. And then probably most importantly for me was to work on the mental side and sort of think about you know, the situation that you were in um, and, and, and trying to, to wrap your head around that, I guess, and think forward and be positive. And so you, know, you can have the other two that are in place, so the muscles can be working, you can work on the, physio on the occupational therapy, but I think if your mind isn't right, then it's, uh, it's, it, it's tough. So, yeah, that for me was one of the biggest things, the biggest hurdles to get over. Next picture kind of really symbolizes the, the progress that I made. So this photograph was taken the week that I left hospital, and I was on an outward bound course in the Lake District. Um, this is actually me dangling off a, a, an abseil rope. So I kind of left this like nice warm um, institution where 
um, I was surrounded by pretty nurses and, and decent food, and, uh, and I was stuck in the Lake District with the rain on my face and the wind in my hair and all of those things. But it was great. It really kind of symbolized the fact that I've made that progress, and um, it was great to be outside again as well, away from that sterile environment. So for me, it kind of felt that I was getting back on track. Um, I went back to university. I, I finished my uh, degree. The graduate, well, I went back a year after I was in the hospital, finished and graduated in 1998. And it was a real like, team achievement for my family, friends, all of the support that I had, um, and a real kind of proud moment, I think so. And then after that, you know, you're back on track, right? So you, you're thinking about what to do next, and that meant getting the job, following everyone else to the big bad city, being in London. And I've done the various jobs through the city, and I'm currently working in Canary Wharf for, for one of these um, financial institutions behind me here. So I work in sustainability, so I'm really lucky that I do a job that I'm really passionate about, um, and ties up with the degree that I did uh, back in geography, uh, sort of the 20 years before. Yeah, in terms of travel, so this photograph was taken uh, on safari last year, and um, I've been traveled to, to Hong Kong recently, um, the States, Europe, you know, quite a few different places. And what the, the picture of me looking kind of rather scared there is uh, on a, a sailing trip as well. So um, I've been sailing, water skiing, um, snow skiing. I think for me, it just kind of symbolizes, you know, two slides before I was talking about being flat on my back, interaction, looking at one spot on the ceiling, thinking that life is going to be a pretty dark and miserable place. And actually, you know, 20 years down the track, it doesn't have to be the case. So in terms of progress, you know, we've, we've all, you know, looking at this, the disability issues, we've all remembered the Paralympics and the great things that those, the rise of the superhumans and what that's done. You know, technology has improved. You know, my, my voice activated software that I use now can probably type quicker than you guys can. So, you know, I've kind of moved forward in that, in that sense. And from a kind of the exoskeletons and the, the great things that they're trying to do around mobility, you know, we're making a huge amount of progress in that area. And, you know, it's crazy to think that I've been in the wheelchair for 20 years and all of the progress that we've made has been fantastic. But I would kind of wonder, is it quick enough, you know? So in most parameters, disabled people, unfortunately, they will be more likely to be un, um, unemployed. They will, will le earn less than, than able-bodied people. And, you know, there are kind of some shocking statistics around their life chances and what their expectations are in life um, in terms of affluence, affluency and that kind of equality in that area. And I would ask you guys today, you know, um, how many people did you meet on the way here? You know, public transport, what can we do to, to make that better? What can we do to free people up? Um, you know, how many people do you work with, do you study with? You know, I work in a building of 8,000 people. There's not many of guys in wheelchairs. And there's, no, there's no reason why. We all work on computers, we work at desks. There's no reason that there shouldn't be more people out there and um, contributing in that way. There's lots that we can do in that sense. And I think, you know, in terms of the media, we've made some good improvements as well. So we're starting to see disabled people not just playing characters as disabled and, you know, in soap operas, and that's their own storyline. You know, disabled people that are presenters, that are real characters in films. And so all of that is really positive. So going back to the kind of the sliding doors uh, moments in life, you know, like uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, I think I've got a slightly better haircut than I did <laughs> at the start in the 90s. But unlike Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, we don't see both sides of the story. Um, I didn't know how my life might have worked out, um, you know, if, if I didn't have that accident in, in, in back in 1996. You know, of course, I wish things were different. You know, I, I, I wouldn't change, you know, I would change it if I could, but, um, you know, it's not one thing that, uh, that's in my control. So, you know, I think if you think about the things that I've learned kind of on that journey, um, I think one is concentrating on things that you can change and not the things you can't. You know, what's done is done what, you know, history is history. Uh, you can't change that. And it's, I think, going back to feelings and, and thinking about, think positive about the future, just concentrate on the things that you can do. And I think if things go wrong for you in life, you know, we spoke before about the fact that you pick up a newspaper, there's, there's, there's things that are happening to people all, all the way around the world and people are experiencing those sliding doors moments um, all the way through through the world and, and, and in the in the UK as well. You know, if things go wrong for, for you and you have that challenge in your life, maybe it's a case of sort of saying, not why me, but why not me? You know, I think that's maybe a, a positive way of kind of framing that situation. And then lastly, you know, if the if the sliding doors do close on you, do close on you in life, um, you have to remember there's always another train coming down the track. So 
you're going to be on a different train, uh, but the most important thing is you're going to be um, still on that journey. And you're going to be in a, a different destination, but you're still going to be making progress.